It was a, 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 a case that, you know, I will never, ever forget. I mean, I can remember, m even to this day, very, very minute details of, of how things looked and what I saw and how things smelled and, and what I did, what my partner, uh, Deputy Mike Braley, did at the time. You know, we, uh, we actually made the comment after we came out and things kind of calmed down. We talked briefly that night and said, you know, this is, this is going to be the biggest case of our, our careers. And, and really, uh, for me, yeah, it, it was true. I, I didn't expect, you know, a, a quadruple death and that the mechanism that they were killed by was going to be a, an axe. Um, I had always anticipated I was going to see bad things. What that was, you know, I had no idea. Then Patrol Deputy Kevin Torgerson and his partner Mike Braley were the first law enforcement officers sent to the home of Bernard and Paulette Brahm in the early evening of February 18th in response to rumors circulating at Lord High School in Rochester concerning a student who had killed his family. Soon after they entered the home, the deputies came upon a crime scene that Hollywood special effects specialists would have a hard time recreating. The bodies of Bernard and Paulette, along with 13-year-old Diane and 11-year-old Richard Brom, were found in the upstairs, and it was apparent they had all been killed by someone wielding an axe. It didn't take long for the rumors of a mass murder to reach the local news media. Andy Brownell had joined the news department at KROC AM earlier that month. Well, my future wife and I were on a date at a Rochester Flyer basketball game. We had a CBA franchise for our time here in Rochester, and that was kind of the thing to do. And we were at the game, uh, enjoying ourselves, and uh, I cannot remember if it was either the first quarter break or if it was halftime. Steve Skogan, the scoop, as we used to call him, our sports director, was working the game, and he found me. Uh, during one of those breaks, and he called me aside, and he had this look of seriousness, and Steve, if you know him, was a prankster, and so I assumed right away something, you know, there's some sort of joke to be done at my, <laughs> my expense, and, and he tells me this tale, that he's talking to folks from Leward High School, and they, they've related this horrible story, that a student at Leward High School had murdered his entire family, and it was an axe murder. And this had just taken place that day, and now people were finally talking about it. And, uh, of course, it wasn't in the news. It wasn't in the news anywhere at that point. Uh, and, frankly, I didn't believe him. I thought it was another one of the Steve Skogan pranks, that uh, somehow this was a joke that these guys were playing on me. But he insisted he was serious, and he insisted that I do something about it. Uh, so, of course, I did. Uh, I found a phone. This is back before cell phones. Uh, and made a call to the, the Sheriff's Department and uh, blatantly just asked the question. I'm hearing stories of a, a horrible multiple victim homicide uh, that the county is investigating and I, I, I need information about it. And the dispatch uh, immediately said, um, well, it's true, but I can't give you any information. You have to talk to the Sheriff. At that time, the Sheriff was Chuck Von Wald, in the Olmstead County Sheriff for a long time. And, uh, well, I, being the evening, and I'm sure the sheriff is at home, I, I immediately asked, how do I get a hold of the sheriff? She gives me a phone number to call. And she says, you should be able to reach the sheriff at this number. Well, lo and behold, it ends up, it is the Brown household phone number. So I'm ringing this phone uh, from the Mayo Civic Center. Uh, it's a rather noisy uh, environment. And I, somebody picks up on the other end. Of course, I have no idea at this time what's happening or the seriousness of it. And, and I identify myself, and they, they patch me through. It takes a few minutes, and Sheriff Charles Von Wald comes on the line. And uh, I, I could tell that immediately just from the tone of his voice that this had happened, this, this unbelievable, horrible tragedy. This was actually taking place, and this was going to be... Uh, the news in the city for quite some time to come and he verified that yes uh, not a lot of details at that point but yes there were multiple victims it was a family that they were looking for the teenage boy uh, in the family he was not in custody uh, and uh, that it, any more information uh, we'd have to be at the scene somebody would have to come out there to this house on, uh, on a big hill northwest of town off 18th Avenue 
and uh, Kim David, I, uh, I called him up, woke him up in fact, because uh, he's working the early shift, getting here at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I relayed to him what the sheriff had told me, and me being uh, a, a green reporter at that, at that point in my career, I was, uh, I was a bit shaken up about this, and, and Kim immediately says, okay, I'm going to get out there, I'll find out you know, what I can, and we'll meet at the station, and we'll go from there, and yeah, he drove out there, and uh, next thing you know, uh, we're spending the next couple of years covering the David Brown case. It's just as vivid today as it was back then, and I'd only been in news, uh, I think, two, three years of that time, so certainly to get a story of this magnitude is just unbelievable, but I get the call at home. I was, I think I was already had gone to bed, and uh, I got the call. Uh, Andy had contacted me, and saying, hey, we're, he we're hearing these stories about a uh, really horrible crime of kid had apparently killed his family members or whatever, and I'm driving around trying to, first of all, trying to find the house. It was, it, it, back then, it was uh, the home was actually still outside the city limits, and that's why the Sheriff's Department was involved. I drive out there, finally find it, drive out there, make contact with uh, the Sheriff, and they were talking about a news conference, and I don't think it sank in how bad that this was until the next day after uh, Brahm had been captured, and they started giving us some of the details of what had happened. David Brahm had actually gone to Lourdes High School the morning after he committed the murders and told a classmate what he'd done. After the slayings were discovered, a massive manhunt was launched in the Rochester area, with law officers and citizens put on high alert for a van the teenager was thought to be driving. Investigators later learned he had spent most of the night sleeping in a culvert at a local concrete plant before he was captured without incident the next morning after he was spotted using a payphone at the Rochester Post Office. Following David's capture and then the court proceedings, um, it, was a, it was a lengthy process. It was surreal. It was uh, first the decision whether or not he should be held in juvenile court. Uh, and for a time, that was the ruling, which um, was kind of a shocking ruling at that time, that a crime so heinous uh, could result in a juvenile correctional sentence. And eventually that was overturned and it went to a full-blown adult trial on first-degree murder charges. And it was a decision of whether or not David, well, not a decision whether or not he was mentally ill. That was clear. David Brown was mentally ill. But whether or not he met the McNaughton standard. And uh, that became, I think everybody in the city of Rochester was well-versed in what the McNaughton standard was. The McNaughton rule, they called it. And it basically is that um, you cannot be excused of your behavior in a criminal case if you, or unless you, are at a point where you don't have any idea what you're doing and uh, you don't have any idea that what you're doing is wrong. And that's a, it's a pretty tough standard. And uh, In this case it was clear that David Brown did know what he was doing and that he did things afterwards and beforehand that clearly shows that he knew what he was doing was wrong. And. Uh... I remember that some of the days I was sitting in there during this testimony, looking at the looking at the stand where he was with his attorney, and just looking. He was just a kid, sixteen year old kid. I mean, he might have been seventeen at the time, but and he was a frail kid. He never said anything. He'd periodically maybe make a comment to his uh, attorney, but and you, you're thinking to yourself, how can how can this kid have done something so horrendous? He would be in the courtroom with him just several feet away, seven, eight feet away for, from where this young boy who did this unbelievably horrible thing uh, was standing trial and you're hearing witnesses describe what happened and what he did and the horribleness of it. Uh, it was horrific but at the same time I had a, I had a cousin who had just he looked so much like David Brom and it just spooked me constantly. So I, I, it got to the point where I couldn't look over at the table where he was sitting because it was so troublesome to see this kid. The facts of the case were nightmarish. David, hours after arguing with his father, grabbed an axe and attacked Bernard Brahm in a violent rage after surprising his mother and father while they were sleeping. He then struck his mother with the axe before directing his violence at his sleeping younger brother and his sister, who he found in the hallway standing over their mortally wounded mother. 
Uh, and really, we don't know exactly why David did what he did, because he's never talked to us or in, right. in a public format. So, you know, only what we can talk about is is what we know from what we saw of evidence that day 30 years ago and, and through the trials that occurred, the two different hearings and trials that were, went on. But, um, you know, there was some difficult stuff going on in that family that, um, uh, and with David himself and trying to deal with issues and questions, concerns that he had and, and feeling that his parents were uh, potentially uh, overbearing or, or whatever, he didn't agree with their rules and such. So, um, you know, we don't know that for sure. The day the verdict came in, it was a Sunday, and I'll never forget because the Vikings had just, just picked up uh, Herschel Walker that year, and they were playing, I think it was his first game, and so all these reporters and news producers are outside the courtroom waiting for the verdict to come in and somebody to come out and tell them what had happened, and they're all watching the Vikings game on their monitors, and I'd gone in to get the verdict, and we were told, reporters were told, you have to sit in this courtroom. You cannot leave until that jury is gone. We don't want you trying to get in touch with them, and we're upset because we're like, well, we want to get the news out. We don't want to sit here for 30 minutes. So Andy Brownell and I came up with this idea that I said, what I will do, even if I get in trouble, I will stand up because that courtroom in the old courthouse had windows. So I told Andy, I will stand up and show my uh, pad, my notepad. If you see that, that means he was convicted. So sure enough, they come in with a verdict. As the jury's leaving, I stand up, even at risk of getting in trouble, and I held the notebook up, and Andy was down outside and saw that, and gets on his phone, a mobile phone I think we had back then, and he's reporting this back to the station live on the air, and all these other reporters are, <laughs> where, where did he get that? How did he get that? On the morning of October 16, 1989, David Brom was found guilty of first-degree murder charges for the slayings of his father, mother, and two younger siblings. He was ordered to serve three consecutive life sentences. While he will be eligible for parole beginning in 2041, it's likely he'll spend the remainder of his days in custody. David is now 46 years old and an inmate of the Stillwater State Prison. I've told people for years and years and years, because I was asked that question many times 30 years ago, did you ever think you would see something like this? Um, well, I answered then like I did today. Uh, not exactly like that, but I knew I was going to see bad things. And one of the things I commonly see in the, in, in the media, and it's not a fault of the media, I'm not going to that, we're there, um, but it's a normal question where uh, the media will ask somebody, uh, did you ever, you know, what did you think? And, or did you ever think you'd see something like that? And the person goes, no, you know, our community is such a nice community. I never thought it would happen here. It can happen anywhere.